Let me open with prayer and we'll get started. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for the sun shining. Thank you for the warmth, uh, the even warmer, uh, the even warmer sense of your presence that we have walking in today with your people. Lord, bless us, uh, bless us for the next few minutes as we st- uh, as we study the work of your people around the world. But Lord, above all, let us see, let us see you and all that we discuss and all that we do and all that we think about today. Lord, we ask your blessing. Lord, we ask your blessing, particularly as we consider missions today. And we ask for we ask your blessing and your protection on the persecuted church. Lord, may we hear may we hear where the church rests uh, relatively where the church rests secure. May we our prayers our prayers are support. And any aid we can send, be with our brothers and sisters who have to pay the price for their testimony. Lord, bless, the, bless, the mission, bless all the missionaries that we support. Lord, go before them even today. Lord, send your spirit to give them power and send our world revival. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, it is Mission Sunday, and uh, I'm get, I get to give the presentation this morning. I'm going to clarify right at the outset, I am not a missionary. We typically hear from a, a proper missionary but um, you got me this morning. So I'm going to be talking for the next. Few, um, I'm going to be talking about um, some of the work of the ministry, some of the work of the ministry that I work for, uh, Water Mission, and this is one of the ministries that we've recently taken uh, that we've recently begun to support as a church. So we thought it'd be good to just give a little update on the um, on the work of Water Mission in general. I've talked about I've talked in Sunday school hour and to some of you personally about different aspects of work. Hope to bring it give a full picture today. I'm going to read a passage of scripture here in just a minute. Um, we'll get started officially, but just remember, today is um, since today is Mission Sundays. You will, Mission Sunday. You will find a faith promise commitment in your bulletins. The session uses that to set our budget for uh, for missions over the next year. Um, so please be thinking and praying even this morning about uh, about the commitment you'd like to make. Isaiah 41: The afflicted and needy are seeking water, but there is none and their tongue is parched with thirst. I, the Lord, will answer them myself. As God of Israel, I will not forsake them. I will open rivers in the bare heights and springs in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land fountains of water. What what did you all use water for this morning? Did anybody use water for anything? No, nothing. Did somebody say, no, we didn't take a shower? We didn't? I hope not. We don't need that kind of confession. <clears throat> Seriously, though, what did you use water for this morning? Shower, coffee. Shower, coffee. Yep, two very good things. Car, brush your teeth, drinking. Yep. We take water for granted. Even though, even though Greenville Water Supply likes to make fun of Spartanburg water, we still get to turn on the tap and know that something relatively decent is going to come out, and we don't think a whole lot about it. It's just a modern utility. It comes out of our bank accounts every week, and it's always there when we need it. And that is not the case for a lot of people around the world. Before I started working for Water Mission four years ago, I'd never even heard of the global water crisis or knew that was a thing. But two billion people, uh, two billion people around the world lack access to safe water. And you're going to hear me use the term safe water a lot, as opposed to what we may call it a lot of people call it clean water, but we're always careful to say safe because water can look clean. It can look crystal clear and sparkly and still make you really, really sick if you drink it. So we always talk about safe water. In addition, there's a lot of things related to water that we don't think about. Uh, once again, I won't, ask for, I won't ask for anybody to shout out what you use your bathrooms for this morning, but 3.6 billion people live without adequate sanitation. And adequate sanitation is just a fancy way of saying you don't have anywhere to go to the bathroom safely, securely, and in a hygienic manner. Um, that latrine is actually not too bad. I've, I've personally seen far worse, um, and uh, it's pretty rough. it can be pretty rough. It's particularly, particularly if you're a woman and you, have to, and you need a few minutes of privacy that can be very hard to find. And once again, we take that for granted. We have bathroom stalls with locking doors. We're out and about. We have our own homes. Uh, and m- much of the world does not have anything like that. Once again, we think about, okay, all right, water, you know, water, if it's a little bit off, does it make that big a difference? And it certainly does. 829,000 people die each year from water-related diseases. In other words, things they picked up from the water that they drank. That's nearly 2,300 people per day. Or 
say it another way, every, somebody passes away every 37 seconds from water-related illness. Nearly half of the hospital beds in the, in the world are filled with people who are there because of a water-related disease. And, um, and that, can be anything, that can be anything from something that they picked up in the water itself to something carried by the mosquitoes that are, you know, that are breeding it in un, you know, unprotected water sources. All of these things are related to water that isn't, that isn't made safe for humans. Even more importantly, there's still a lot of spiritual darkness in the world around us. Um, this is the number that really gets me every time. Five billion people do not know Jesus Christ. I have a global population of what, eight billion now? That's pretty convicting. And of those two billion, have virtually no exposure to the gospel message. Unreached people groups are a real thing. Even places where they have churches or some, present or some representation of the gospel, their um, uh, church leadership are often ill-equipped to actually share the life-altering life message of Jesus Christ. So there's a, there's a huge global need for safe water and huge global need for living water. And at Water Mission, we talk about those things a lot. Um, So our, mission, so our mission is to honor God by developing, implementing, and sharing best-in-class safe water solutions that transform as many lives as possible, as quickly as possible. We, are a, we describe ourselves as a Christian engineering ministry. I am not an engineer. I, uh, I'm a, I work in marketing because I'm not smart enough to be an engineer. And, um, and I can tell you as a marketeer, Christian engineering ministry does not roll off the tongue. It's very hard to put in the brochure. We've argued and fussed and said, we've got to say something better. And our founders and our leadership says, no, that's who we are. All those words are important. We're Christian first. We're doing this in the name of Lord Jesus. We are engineers. And we are ministry. Those, and uh, those three things really sum up uh, who we are. Because, safe water is, because bringing safe water is a big undertaking. Water utilities, we're going to see this when we talk about Asheville, North Carolina here at the end, but water utilities are very, very fragile things. It's, you can't just go dig a hole in the ground and drink whatever comes out in most places of the world. You definitely, that's definitely not going to work if you're trying to serve a lot of people. It takes a lot of technology. It takes a lot of experience. It takes, it takes a lot of operation and maintenance. You can have it all set up today and everything's working great, and six months later, all of your fancy equipment is just rusting because it's not been kept up or operated correctly. It's an ongoing process that we're trying to set up. Oh, that was a slide I was supposed to be talking over. All right, let me share a little video and we'll make sure that our audio is going. Water builds life. It builds health, opening doors to education and livelihoods. Water builds hope. It gives families and communities opportunities to thrive. But more than two billion people lack access to this essential, life-giving resource. So, we began a mission to love others and honor God by bringing safe and living water to those without. A mission that started with a single sip, now continues because of people like you. Together, we transform lives around the world. We seek to serve with excellence, building safe water solutions that stand the test of time. With integrity, accountable to those who come alongside us in hope. And always with love for those we serve. At Water Mission, we build safe water solutions because water builds life. Sorry for y'all in the sorry for y'all in the front row. You may have got blown out by that. So we've been um, since being found in two thousand one. We've built nearly thirty two hundred safe water and sanitation projects around the world. We've also built in almost uh, built almost 35,000 latrines. And a latrine is just that, that just means a toilet with a door on it. That's what that means. 
and they can be very, very minimal things. Um, but this, we do a lot of this work in Latin America in particular, and we do, we do concrete cast latrine enclosures, and they can re they're designed, they can resist hurricanes. So very often a storm will go through and nothing will be left standing except one of our latri latrines. <laughs> you laugh until you don't have one, and then you're glad that's the only thing you've got left. Um, our, our, I'm going off script now. Our, um, <laughs> our team in Honduras, they break all of our brand standards. Our colors are blue. We're all about blue. And they paint their latrines teal, and they put a rainbow-colored door on them. There's the most garish thing ever. And when you drive through the landscape, you can just pick them out. You can pick them out wherever they've been built. And it, I, I'm being very sentimental. It's like this beacon of hope. Because what people tell us is that safe water is great, but we often have to educate people. And like, this water that you're giving me doesn't look that much different from this water. Do I really need to drink it? So we have whole, we, we have whole education programs designed to explain the importance of water. But you know what? You build a better toilet, and everybody's on board instantly. You don't have to do any education on that. <laughs> We've also done um, more than 300,000 people provide access to sanitation, and that includes not just uh, restroom facilities, but that's also things like hand washing. Once again, something we take for granted, and a lot of people either don't know the importance of or don't have the facilities to actually do it on a regular basis. You know, parents, it's fall, we're heading into winter, kids have had runny noses, you've been sick perpetually. Imagine what that would be like if you couldn't even wash your hands on a regular basis. It's these simple things that make all the difference. Overall, we've served more than 8 million people. And that number is way less than 2 billion we're working on. There's a lot to do. Oop, hit too many. We have, um, our headquarters are in, is in Charleston, South Carolina, and we have permanent country offices in um, eight countries around the world. From, uh, from, central, from here in North America and Mexico, and places like Mexico and Honduras, down in South America and Peru, Four countries in Africa and, as a, and, a lot, and a very, very busy, very, very busy office in Indonesia as well. I, we, we could take all morning just talk about Indonesia. It's, uh, Indonesia has the largest Muslim population in the world, far more than anywhere in the Middle East. It ha, it ex, the country exists of, tw of more than 1,200 islands. It takes forever just to get anywhere within this country. And you could be dealing with, you could be dealing with tropical islands in one place and arid climates the next. It just varies a lot from one to the next. Our engineers literally have to pack up their families and go live for six to 12 months on different places because it takes too long to travel back and forth from offices to project sites. So to back up, we were found, Watermish was found in 2001. It was founded by Charlestonians George and Molly Green. They were running a successful engineering firm in Charleston, and in 1998, Hurricane Mitch devastated the country of Honduras. Honduras is basically a little bridge between the Atlantic and the Pacific, and if a hurricane, in the Gulf, and if a hurricane hits just right, it'll just go plowing right across the country from one end to the next. Tremendous, tremendous need. So, um, so George and Molly were wrestling with, so the Lord laid on their hearts to do something. So they reached out to a church leader they knew in the area and received a request back for, uh, for water filtration systems. And so George pulled out a legal pad, and he's like, I'm an engineer, I can figure this out, and put together the, uh, the rudimentary design for, um, for a system that we, for the, the first version of a system we still use today. Um, there are systems based on his initial design that are up in North Carolina right now, which you'll see in a minute. They got those, he designed it, they pulled, it, they pulled a bunch of people from their company to build it. They traveled down to Honduras, had them up and running in about eight days uh, after they got the initial request. When they arrived, they were shocked because the water that people were drinking was often coming from rivers that were, were deep brown with dirt and toxins, causing illness and leading to death. You, saw, you may have seen this video, I've seen this photo. This is a very famous photo because once they got the water systems up and operational, people still wouldn't drink from it because they call it, the, the source was literally, known as, was literally known as the Rio de Muerta, the river of death. It was so contaminated. So they've got this nice, clear, safe water sparkling out of their filtration system and nobody will drink it. So our co-founder, Molly Green, she's like, give me that. So she grabs the hose and she takes the first sip and then, uh, and then George does after her and, you know, and that's enough. Once everybody sees they put them, see them put their money where their mouth is, then the system comes into full operation. 
And so that was, and that was 1998, and that never, and the Greens couldn't stop thinking about that. That was their introduction to the global water crisis, because what they began to realize is they talked to people and read, and read and studied and traveled was that what had happened temporarily in Honduras was a permanent problem, you know, both there and in other parts of the world. So three years later, three years later, they sold their engineering firm and started uh, started Water Mission, coming up in our 25th anniversary in 2026. So we bring safe water for three main areas. We, we're serving communities, and a community, our community is, I mean, don't think of anything like Spartanburg, that's too big. People, you know, people typ typically go to, you know, urban areas like this. Our focus is primarily on rural communities, last mile communities, the places that are really hard to get to, the places that don't have reliable power, don't have water systems, don't have adequate sanitation, just because it's so hard to get anything out there. Um, so we're looking for those places to serve safe water, sanitation, hygiene. And then kind of a concentrated example of that is we're very active in refugee camps and settlements all over the world for people displaced by humanitarian crises, basically folks who can't go home again. Most re we'll talk about refugees in a minute, but most refugees live in a camp for an average of 20 years. It's usually a change for, change for life when it happens. And then finally, disaster relief. And yet, if you're wondering, yes, this is a lot to bite off. And we all regularly have conversations like, oh, man, are we doing too much? But we can't ever neglect disaster relief because water is one of the first things to go in a disaster, be it a hurricane, an earthquake, a war, uh, water infrastructure. You, you, know, you, can't, you can't fudge water. You can't just say it's some of it there. As soon as one piece breaks, the whole thing goes down. So there's always a huge need. All right, I'm tempted to talk about this cool man in the hat, in the hat behind me, but we do not have time. If you want to hear a neat story, ask me about this guy afterwards. So we'll talk about communities just briefly. Um, how are we doing on time? Yeah, wow, this is going fast. So we do, like I said, permanent communities. Um, most, there's a, real, there's a real integration between all the work that we do. We typically, our permanent country offices typically begin because we were there for a disaster. And once we're in the process of helping, we, provide, we help provide immediate relief, and then we help to try to build back water infrastructure and then, we, and then we often find out, oh, there was a huge need even before this crisis happened. And so, we'll, and so we'll stay on. That's the way most of our country programs have started. And Indonesia was no exception. Um, we were <coughs> we've officially established our office there in 2005 after the, uh, after the tsunami in 2004. Which may, that was one of the biggest news items of that year. Um, we've had more than 180 safe water projects and it's serving nearly 400,000 people. I always see these numbers and I think, oh, I wish those were higher. And yeah, we, we all do. But the thing to remember is it's not just enough to build a safe water project because we've, you know, we've seen that, we have, we've personally been out and seen safe water projects that were, that were well designed, that were well implemented, that were de desperately needed and were no longer operational. It's basically just equipment out in the, you know, equipment out in the field now. Um, so we, we don't always serve every community we visit. Even if there's a need, that's not the only criteria for us. Because we, we have seen that um, a system only works if we have the participation, uh, the participation and commitment of the community that we go in to serve. So we actually spend six months assessing, uh, assessing a project site before we even begin design, design, let alone implementation. And one of the big things we're looking for is the people and their willingness to you know, take financial responsibility for what comes. We, we throw around the word sustainability a lot in this day and age, and one of the most important ones is financial sustainability. If you don't have a business model to actually keep a system running, then you won't have safe water you know, in the near future. Uh, many people are surprised to learn in most of our projects, we actually charge a little bit for our water. It's typically far less than what people might be paying for bottled water delivery or other sources that they're having, but it is there. We don't charge anything to build the system, but we train, we train the operators and to, in order to, um, to build, you know, build a model that will make sure that two years from now, the very best equipment is gonna break down and wear out, and you need to make sure that you've got, a, you've got some savings in the bank ready to restore that. Or you're gonna lose everything that you've got. Peru, we could talk all day about Peru. Peru, uh, we offer, operate out of Iquitos um, and, and, um, and Pura. 
Um, I wish we could talk about Iquitos all day. It's the largest landlocked city in the world. There are no roads or railroads into it. The only way to get to it is by plane or boat. 500, that half a million people right in the middle of the, the, the Amazon rainforest. It's so hard to get to projects that our office there literally has a boat. And it's this big, it's this big barge, basically the length of the sanctuary here. And we haul equipment and personnel up and down the Amazon River to serve communities along it. So one of my, it's my, one of my aspirations to ride on this boat one day. It's so cool. And this in Peru is so befuddling because there's water everywhere. It's one of the most saturated, it's one of the most saturated parts of the world. And you will die if you drink most of that water. Um, so in most case, you know, so most cases, it doesn't look like a place that has any need. Except that, you know, except that you don't want to drink anything that you come across there. Tanzania, we just, uh, actually I need to change the slide. We just hired our very, our very newest team member as a new director for our Tanzania program. Uh, his name is Kagunda, and he is, from, he is from Kenya. He and his family are actually moving to Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, as we speak. Um, and he, uh, he will be taking over the leadership of our program there because the, uh, the last guy got promoted. We, this is a um, tremendous, tremendous water need, uh, both in the middle of the country where, there's not, where the water is very, very deep underground, and in the north of the country where there's a lot of refugee camps, and that's where a lot of our work focuses. 90% 90, 90 of our staff who do the actual work of water mission are uh, locally, locally hired and bring their knowledge and expertise to serve their own, their fellow countrymen. And uh, they, we require, we only hire Christians. There is a statement, there is a very, there's a very simple but sound statement of faith that both I and the new director of the Tanzania program and, you, and, uh, you know, and staff setting up systems on an island in Indonesia, we all profess, you know, we all profess in the living and true God, the Lord Jesus Christ, and commit to do our work in his name. Whether we're doing something helpful, uh, helpful like putting in a water system or sending out a ton of emails like I do. Safe water for refugees. More than eight, 84 million people are forcefully displaced due to violence, persecution, political instability, food insecurity, or natural disasters. There's a lot of reasons that people just have to pick up everything and leave. And you really want to get these right, because these folks literally, in many cases, don't have time to grab anything. They just have to get their loved ones and get on the road and get out of Dodge as quickly as possible. We're, um, through customized solutions, we help those in refugee camps experience healthier and more dignified living conditions. Um, there's a lot of camps we could talk about. Um, the one, um, uh, the, the picture that you see up in front of you, this is from a couple named Mary and Moses. They are Sudanese refugees and the parents of 10 children. They live in Rhino Camp in northern Uganda. They've been there... The camp's been there since 1980. I don't remember how long Mary and Moses have been there, um, but it's been a while. I think they added three or four children since their time coming there. And they don't, I mean, that thatch, that thatch hut behind them is basically all they have in the world. They had to leave the jobs, they had to leave family, they had to leave any, everything they knew in South Sudan when they fled uh, the ongoing conflicts there. They don't even speak the language. Um, there's innumerable, you know, there's innumerable languages spoken throughout, throughout East Africa, or throughout West Africa. Um, Uganda is primarily, uh, primarily English. Refugees don't speak that. They speak their own dialect. So they basically come in, they can't even ask for help, except for, you know, except through interpreters, you know, interpreters and translators. There's about 151,000 people in Rhino Camp currently, and it is a receiving camp. A hundred new people typically arrive every single day, so the camp is growing and growing and growing. Uh, the region's very. Don't be fooled by the. Uh, don't be fooled by the green trees in the background of this photo. That's not what it typically looks like. They've had a lot of rain this year, so it was it was really really pretty. Um, you know, so it's really really pretty at this time, uh, but usually it's pretty arid. What water sources there are are little streams and rivers that typically dry up, uh, typically dry up around the middle of the year. Um, they're just a few. They're just a few hundred miles north of the equator, uh, where they're located in northern Uganda. And if water systems, so there's plenty of water. It's just hundreds and hundreds of feet underground. So all of our solutions there, we dig what are called boreholes because they're too big to be called wells. 
and they're pulling out you know, tens of thousands of gallons to serve the needs of the community. If those systems go down, <coughs> there are not a lot of options. People have to rely upon what they've stored or they have to go back to scooping stuff out of rivers and streams and you know, if they're careful, boiling it uh, before they consume it. But I mean, those rivers and streams are also being used by livestock, they're also being used by local wildlife, they're being used for bathing. Um, not the kind of things you want to be sharing your, water, your drinking water source with um, as you go through. In these cases, we have in these cases we work with. Uh, lo uh, there's a lot of nonprofit and humanitarian organizations in these camps. We're usually coordinating our work uh, with a lot of them, and that's pretty true for it's pretty true for uh, that's pretty true for all the refugee camps we're in. It's like community service, only much more so. There's a lot to there's a lot to juggle. Then finally, disaster response. Water mission. Uh, Water Mission founded with a disaster response, and we've been doing them ever since. We've responded to uh, responded to more than 60 natural disasters, humanitarian crises the world over. In 2015, this is one we like to talk about. More than 100,000 refugees um, fled uh, fled armed conflict in Burundi, and ended up in Niragusu refugee camp in Tan in uh, north northwestern Tanzania. It was, it was a nightmare because these people had nowhere to go. They all landed there and there's no infrastructure to support them. So this is what, so this, we consider this a disaster because it wasn't normal daily operation like some of the other refugee camps were in. This is like all of a sudden you had no one and now you've got everyone and you've got to get them water really, really fast. We pulled staff from all over the world. We had, we had folks coming from Indonesia to, um, into Africa to help with this response. And we, like all disaster responses, we started with a very quick temporary solution, which involves uh, portable, easily installed water filtration systems and generators, and then slowly took, upgraded those projects into more permanent solutions, typically uh, and powered by solar panels. Uh, we're very, very well known for solar, solar powered water pumping. And we do that because very often we don't have any other choice. There's not a lot of, there's not a lot of reliable power. Diesel gets very expensive very quickly and it can be hard to get anyway. So we harness, uh, we har so we'll set up solar arrays and harness that to keep things operational. We actually work with a lot of, we work with some, work some companies you may have heard of like Kohler to develop custom power blending solutions where you'll have solar power coming in and solar power fluctuates with the sunlight obviously. So we'll often have a generator running as a backup system and as the sunlight starts to dip, our power blending solutions will actually throttle up the generator so it can make up the difference and keep the flow of water consistent. This is really high end stuff and this is why we had, this is why, remember the Christian engineering ministry, this is the engineering part. It's really, really hard to do. And a lot of these companies, you know, and a lot of these companies, they're not Christian organizations per se. And so one of the things that, you know, one of the favorite, you know, one of the favorite passages of scripture that our CEO, CEO likes to quote is from Proverbs where he says, you see a man skilled in his work he will stand before kings. And we are so respected, uh, we are so respected and for the quality of our work that a lot of people come to us for our expertise and for our aid. Um, not because of our testimony, but because of our knowledge, which opens the doors for our testimony to go out. Texas, we responded in Texas. Some of you may remember in 2021, they, they had a lot, they had a big winter storm in Texas, which is not words that you hear very often. And the Texans were not prepared for this. So you had pipes bursting up in the, up in the ceilings and foundations and walls, just making a huge mess. So we actually responded there. We don't do a whole lot. We typically don't do a whole lot of U.S. responses. There's a lot of organizations that do do that. There's a lot of red tape. Although our water projects meet or exceed U.S. standards for water quality, there's just, uh, we're, we're, our focus has always been on global disasters. But Lord does open up opportunities to work a little closer to home. Haiti earthquake um, in 2021. There was a 7.2 magnitude earthquake that hit southern Haiti. Um, we were we had a lot of resources in the area we were able to respond to, um, and there was tremendous need there. In 2022, um, the the war between Ru uh, Russia and, and Ukraine began. We had we were on the ground within four days of the start of that work. Uh, we were in the surrounding countries at the time assessing needs. Uh, and initially, we were initially supporting um, people, uh, refugees fleeing the country into the surrounding, uh, into their neighbors. And now we have, I can't show you a map of where we're serving now because it's right along the front lines of the conflict. 
Um, and if, and, you know, if certain parties knew where some of our water systems were, then they would become targets. Uh, but we've been, they've been in continual operation serving areas affected by, you know, affected by the very immediate conflict ever since as we head into three, year, uh, three years of the conflict. I've given a presentation on the earthquake in Turkey as well. I was blessed to be uh, deployed there for a time to help support that response. And by support, I mean standing around with a camera and try to look important. Um, that, was a huge, that was a huge mess uh, and will be for a very, very long time. Because basically tall buildings where a lot of people left were either reduced to rubble on the ground or they were so, they were so structurally uh, undermined that nobody can live in, they'll have to be torn down, which is almost worse. You almost wish the earthquake could just make a clean job of it and tear everything down. But there were, a lot, <coughs> there were a lot of buildings that were still standing and they structurally looked fine until you notice the hairline cracks had, you know, from foundation to roof um, that you know, should give you pause. Um, a lot of cities look, uh, one of the cities that we were serving is uh, named Karaman Marash. It took me two weeks to learn how to say that, you're welcome. And as you drive up, you think, it looks fine. And then night falls, and there are no lights because all, because all the windows have been smashed out and all the power has been cut to all the buildings. It's basically a ghost city in large parts of it. So you'll drive through a shopping district that's come back up and running, at least by the time I was there, and then you'll drive out in the residential section, and there's nowhere for anybody to live. And folks literally just, there's their apartment building, can't live in it. They move down the street and put up a tent, and that's where they were living you know, at the time. Sometimes the government or local relief organizations had set up an official camp. Other times people had just found what corner they could to, for their family. Um, I got to take shelter in one of those tents uh, to get out of a rain shower. And, you know, it's amazing how efficient, you know, how efficient you can be when that, you know that's the only space you've got. Families of six living in, you know, living inside a large camping tent with what their most important possessions stowed under and packed away as tightly as you can. And finally, another one closer to home, Hurricane Helena. As we all know, tore through the southeast from Florida all the way up to southwest Virginia, killing at least 226 people across six states. That number is probably low uh, as more things are being found. $35 billion worth of estimated damage. We, uh, we got a taste of that here. A lot of us can remember. We, we were affected. Matter of fact, my, uh, my family and I passed one of those trucks picking up all the tree branches this morning, um, and that's going to be going on for a while, but it's nothing compared to what Western North Carolina saw. Uh, as poorly prepared as we are for a hurricane, mountain communities have absolutely nothing. So in one area, you'd have winds that would, would, have just, would, would just level buildings. Um, in other places, you'd have, the runoff from the mountains would cause you know, unprecedented flooding through areas, um, like, this shot of the, like this shot of the road we're seeing. We responded initially, um, again, I think we were like two, three days uh, heading up to Boone, North Carolina, which is, uh, we had some staff up there, so we had a lot of opportunities to serve, and we loaded up a bunch of generators and mobile water treatment systems. And I'll just show you a quick video. I'm going to show you one other video, mainly because this one's really cool. This is Brock Price from the Watch. Today, you receive digital safe water treatment systems to support families impacted by Hurricane Helena. These systems were delivered by retired members of the United States Armed Forces who made a helicopter drop right where our team was stationed at First Presbyterian Church in Boone. There are still many families across Western North Carolina without access. Thanks to these brave responders who deliver these systems, we can expand our reach to provide more people with the safe water they purchase and need. To learn more or get involved in our response to Hurricane Helena, please visit watermission.org.
For those of you who are um, military history enthusiasts, that, is a, that was a Huey helicopter, Vietnam era troop transport, and uh, they, so these group of retired veterans had kept this thing in full working order and flew a lot of supplies up to us. <coughs> it's typically about five hours from Charleston, from our headquarters in Charleston up to Boone. Took our director of disaster response, who heard speaking, took him about eight, just because once he got past Charlotte, it was really, really rough going, particularly with a big old truck. There was one point where he didn't know if he was gonna have to just abandon the truck and go on foot and try to pick it up later. Uh, the Lord got him through, and then thankfully we were able to get, um, thankfully we'll get further supplies brought in. Our response is still going on up in Western North Carolina, but we've moved from the immediate need of Boone into Asheville, North Carolina. Um, I went to school in Asheville, and even then, well, Asheville water supply was notorious. It's very, very old. It's a lot of lead and copper piping. It's rusty. It's buried. It's very hard to get to, uh, you don't, and um, it's in pretty rough shape. Hurricane Elena hit hit there in September on September 26th, and much like for uh, about the same time it hit us, and much like here, it was early mornings, and so people heard the wind start blowing. Like, okay, this is going to be a big storm, and they didn't realize. How, and many people didn't real unless they were right in the path of a flood or the wind. Many people didn't even realize how big it was until they realized it could make cell calls on their cell phones, which we all still remember. That is, I mean, that's a real crisis. Like, I can't doom scroll my way through breakfast. What on earth am I going to do? In the months since the storm, power and water has been restored to most of the city of Asheville. But the water treatment system was knocked out of commission is likely going to remain through, so through the end of the year. Um, I was up there two weeks ago. Um, I was up there two weeks ago. What I was being told was the water coming out of the taps and into the toilets is brownish. Actually, it's yellow. Let's, just, let's call it for what it is. The water is yellow coming, coming straight out of the tap. And uh, they're, they're currently trying to shock treat it with chlorine, but that doesn't really work because there's so much what we call turbidity. And turbidity is just stuff in the water, dirt and, dirt and gravel and things like that. Um, and so chlorine, you can't treat wa turbid water with chlorine because the chlorine will just latch onto the dirt and won't attack the stuff you actually need it to. So we're actually in the process, we've actually been installing safe water systems in schools. Um, not just for the students and faculty, definitely for them, but also, um, but you know, frankly, they've all been shopping Costco and they've got pallets and pallets and pallets of water bottles that they were using until these systems got set up. Um, so there's a ton of plastic floating around Asheville schools right now. The other need, though, is just people, uh, you know, people in their homes are dealing with the same issue. Everything looks, unless you're in Biltmore Village, everything looks fairly normal in Asheville these days until you turn on your tap and you get this nasty water coming out of it. So a lot of these systems are set up so that um, families can collect water on their way home. And I've got one last video. This is hot off the press. No one's seen this but you. Um, I, I had a team member who was up there on Friday. He sent, and uh, I begged him for this for a presentation today. Keep Asheville in your prayers. Um, keep Eastern Tennessee, keep Western North Carolina, because there'll be this ramifications of this will be felt for a very, very long time. One of my team members, uh, his wife works for the school district up in uh, up around Boone, North Carolina, and they just started regular classes back again. One of the and there were a lot of things to wrestle through, but one of the hardest things is just they had a lot of student families and faculty who just lost everything, just homes completely wiped out, destroyed. Some of the videos I didn't show you um, show our water system being set up, and it's uncanny just how much it looks like, you know, looks like a setup in a refugee camp or a developing country community. It's the same. It, thank the Lord for what we have, because it can be taken away very quickly, which is very scary and very humbling. Um, but we are all, you know, around the world, we're all ultimately have the same needs, and the Lord, you know, the Lord can provide those and he can take those away. And uh, we're not, none of us are that far, as we all, even we learned a few weeks ago, you know, we are that, we are just this close to a similar crisis. 
And then finally, I save the best for last, and we can't talk about this enough either. And that's because living water ministry at Water Mission is not easy to summarize. It takes many, many forms. Um, you know, we work with, whether it's, you know, school teachers in Asheville or, you know, or uh, regional leaders in refugee camps, whether it's, uh, whether it's families fleeing their homes in Ukraine, um, our staff is very, very intentional to pray, uh, to speak the name of Christ, to make it clear that why we're doing what we're doing uh, because of our Lord's command to love our neighbor. Um, lifestyle evangelism, you might call it. Uh, but, all, you know, but ultimately, we, you know, a lot of relationships are built with the work that we do, and a lot of doorways are open to talk about the reason that, you know, the reason that we have hope and share that with others. We're also very intentional to build the local church. Whenever possible, we like to build safe water projects you know, on church property. They're often central to the community, and that brings people, that brings people within the orbit of the, of the ministry. Not always possible. So in which cases, we'll often use churches for, you know, for um, water safety training. And, do, and again, bring people and to see the church as a resource for their physical needs so that there's a, there's a chance to reach them with their, to serve their spiritual need as well. We also partnered to do a lot of training, uh, a lot of training with ministries to, uh, to build up church leaders. Uh, we've done everything from, you know, we've done everything from Bible training sessions to marriage seminars that we've been able to set up and coordinate all over the world. This is an area of, this, like everything else we do, requires a lot of intent, a lot of focus, a lot of talented people, a lot of prayer. Um, because uh, the need, you know, the way that, you know, the way that sin, uh, the way that sin and separation from God manifests itself varies um, from one part of the world to the next. This is one of the reasons that we work with local staff, um, just who, who, can speak, uh, who can speak local languages, who can understand local cultural, uh, local cultural situations, you have to be very careful. There's countries where you can't openly speak about Christ, and we're still, but we're still able to work um, because they still thirst and they still have need for water, and that can open doors uh, that wouldn't be open ordinarily. Um, there's a there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of complexity to this work. And that brings me to the end of what I had prepared. Are there any any questions or anything I can answer this morning? Yes, sir. Yeah, that's a great question. Our financial stability model is primarily focused on communities, established communities where there are resources of some kind. We're not charging anything in, in, in uh, disaster areas, not immediately anyway, not until we move from temporary relief into permanent solutions and things start to rebuild. Mm -hmm. Well, part, yep, part of it is other organizations say, hey, we don't, aren't good at this. So we have a lot of resources put toward this. We're going to commit to you. Part of it are through churches, just like this one, um, that, who are able to give and help, a, help us support. Uh, a lot of folks came alongside the Helena response and allow us to do, allow us to provide generators and water. Uh, we also have regular sustaining supporters who are committed to that work, who make it possible. And then in refugee camps, you also have, you also have multinational organizations. You have, whole you have whole governments and UN organizations who, take, who have responsibilities for these camps. And they'll say, we, and we'll be brought in as a water contractor or consultant um, because they have, the, they have the mandate to run the camp for whatever means necessary. Because you're right, if you dropped everything and fled from Sudan or the Congo, you don't have anything to pay with. Uh, that's just part of the service provided by the host country and those that are supporting it. Depends a lot on the situation. What are they charging for a gallon of water? What are they charged for a gallon of water? That depends where you are. A lot of market analysis goes into that. Um, I don't know. <laughs> now you're pushing the back. I'm just curious. The one place I can think of is uh, in... I visited a safe water project in Honduras. They were pretty, um, Honduran currency is the lira, I believe. 
and they were tr they were paying like eight to twelve lira for to get bottled water delivered in from far away, and then after we set up our safe water system, you could either come pay like one lira to get it filled, or two to three if uh, a local entrepreneur had uh, set up a delivery service of his own. Hmm. So well below what they were paying before. I don't. Okay, Nathan, I think I saw you first. <laughs> Yeah. Yep. We do. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a very big conversation. Um, you, were asking, you were talking about municipal water supplies here, big, expensive, complicated projects, and they're big, expensive, and complicated in other countries as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this is, again, this is why we hire local staff. This is why we try to use local resources just to, you know, to control costs, you know, try to control costs as much as possible. But yeah, project, you know, a safe water project we're building costs a lot and can take a while, you know, it can take up to a year to fully implement. Now, tell me how, how much is it for Depends. Once again, like, you know, like with what cost is, it depends where you are in the world, depends on exchange rates, all kinds of factors, but it can be anywhere up to $100,000 for a project. It's either easier, they're cheaper thing, they're cheaper help to bring than water. But, you know, like Sarah observed, water is one of the first things that you need. And that's again, that's again why we build for the long term. Um, there are organizations that can build a water system cheaper than we can, but we use the very, very, very best stuff because we want it to last. And we spend a lot of time training people to keep it running. Yeah, good question. Oh, and then the other thing I'll say is we're actually, you, you brought up water municipalities. We are actually looking to expand our model into setting up a municipal water systems and professionalizing a lot of our work. So rather than, you know, rather than just community managed, as we call it, where communities responsible for their water supply, we are actually looking to set up things that will serve multiple communities all at once and not only provide water, but jobs and economic, you know, potential for economic development um, in areas as well. Matt, was it you or Bennett? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, as in, do we build reservoirs and things? Uh, well, you don't want to store too much water for too long because there's only so much you can do to keep that. So we typically do have reservoirs, but they're designed to be they're designed to be a buffer to make sure that you know the water supply is constant. Um, we're not stockpiling, you know, we're not, at least at this point, we haven't set up any, you know, any big water towers or anything like that. We do small ones. In most cases, they're part of a distribution system. You'll, you typically find the lowest spot that you can to dig your borehole or your well, and then pick the highest spot you can to put your reservoir, because you're pumping, and then you're pumping up the hill so that people, it can, you can gravity feed, no power required to get the water out where it needs to be. You focus all your power needs at the pump, you fill your reservoir. And then that reservoir usually has enough to serve the community, and then you and you're constantly replenishing it by the pump. Is that answering your question? Yeah. 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 And once again, those reservoirs take very, very different forms. I don't know if you saw behind the um, the teacher in Asheville, but we actually had four big tanks behind them. Yeah. And those are pretty small. Those are our portable systems. So you know, if if you were in a refugee camp, you'd see something much, much bigger than that. Yeah. Yeah, Ryan. We don't have enough time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the biggest thing I would say is there's always challenges. Local governments, uh, national and local governments can move slow 
I believe it or not, government can move slow. Um, you, you, can, <laughs> you, can have, um, you can have multinational organizations who don't, or we're not faith aligned, as we, as we delicately put it. You can, have, you can have local violence, even if you're not on the level of a refugee crisis, you still have local violence, local violence going on. And uh, people who just want, and people are sinners everywhere. People who just want to tear down, uh, tear down things around them, and water. And like I said before, water is fragile. There's a there's a lot of equipment that has to be protected and maintained. There's a lot of stuff that has to be transported, and you need you need clear roads to get through things like that. Um, ask me afterwards; I can share some more stories. I once spent three hours talking to the director of our work in Haiti. And man, did that guy have some stories to tell? Yeah. yeah. We got, we got to wrap it up. So happy to take questions later, but let me pray. Thank you for your time. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Lord, I pray that, Lord, as we're reminded of the need around the world, I pray we would not feel guilt, but a deep sense of gratitude for how much you have given us. Lord, also give us endurance of heart. You can take away everything we have in an instant. And, it, and you are God, and you, can, you would still do, you are God, and that is your prerogative. So, Lord, we thank you for all that we have. We thank you that we're clean and well-fed and drank water that doesn't make us sick this morning. And, Lord, we pray that you would please bless those who are, those who are working to bring relief and to quench thirst around the world. And, Lord, bless the work of Water Mission and many other organizations uh, like it who are bringing this need. And, Lord, as we pray as we prayed at the start for our missionaries, Lord, send the Spirit along with every bottle of water, with every pump, uh, with every reservoir that's sent out. May it go and uh, may it go and open and share and um, show people their need. Show, show people that their need for you is even greater than their need for water. Lord, uh, bless us this morning as we worship you in Jesus' name. Amen.